Hey everyone, welcome to Mythology Explained. The topic of this video is Zeus Amon, a god coalesced from Greek and Egyptian counterparts. More broadly, we'll explore the intermingling of Greek and Egyptian mythology in general, which yielded a multitude of other gods and mutually influenced rituals. Another notable example being Hermanubis, a deity that combined the Greek god Hermes with the Egyptian god Anubis. As well, Alexander the Great will be a main focus, his conquests suffusing much of the ancient world with Greek culture like never before. Most significant with respect to this video was his liberation of Egypt, which had, until his arrival, been under Persian control for centuries. The Egyptians welcomed Alexander, they made him pharaoh, consecrating him as the son of a moon, and he cultivated this image, fanning the flames of divinity. He referred to himself as the son of Zeus Amon, and he promulgated this image across his empire. Coinage depicting him with the gods curved ram's horns disseminated far and wide. Alright, let's get into it. Zeus Amon is a composite deity that combines Zeus, the Greek king of the gods, and a moon, whom the Greeks call the Mon, the Egyptian king of the gods in certain traditions. The extent to which these two gods were synthesized varied greatly, contingent on time and location. Sometimes the product of scholarly pragmatism, equating the two, as well as many other gods to better understand foreign religions their gods and myths, sometimes viewing them as interchangeable points of worship, two names for the same god, sometimes as a distinct deity that amalgamated elements of each, and so on. Many of the depictions of Zeus Amon, who could also be called Zeus, Amun, or Amon, depending on the region and the degree to which the two gods were integrated, combined elements of each god's appearance. Zeus was bearded and stately, with a look of authority and wavy neck-length hair. By comparison, Amun's own depictions were more varied. He could be zoomorphic, shown as a ram, could be human, and could be a hybrid, a man with the head of a ram. Many surviving works combine the likeness of Zeus with a pair of ram's horns curling out from his head, showing the conflation of the two. As well, much of the coinage minted by Alexander the Great, who adopted the epithet son of Zeus Amon, showed him in similar fashion, his likeness with the same pair of horns. This helped to propagate the image of him as the son of the divine, asserting his conquest and the vast territory he consolidated as ordained by the highest authority. In antiquity, the Mediterranean teemed with trade. Countless boats sailing from port to port, like bees buzzing between flower and hive, unloading pregnant hulls soon to be laden once more. More than this, though, was the exportation and importation, the cross-pollination, of cultures less tangible aspects, such as mythology and religion, exotic stories and far-off gods born from shore to shore. This phenomenon is basically universal to proximal civilizations but more germane here is that it happened between the Greeks and the Egyptians. The Greeks equated some of their gods with some of those in the Egyptian pantheon, establishing Greek-Egyptian counterparts. This seems to have been a mostly one-sided dynamic, the Greeks much more interested in this than their neighbors across the sea. Zeus, the king of the Greek gods, and Amun, the king of the Egyptian gods, were thus linked amalgamated into the composite Zeus Amon. This is an example of interpretatio greca, a term coined millennia later by scholars, a term we'll circle back to later on. It was the ancient Greek practice of equating domestic gods with foreign gods. It was a way for the Greeks to understand and relate to the religions and, more broadly, to the cultures they encountered. By equating foreign deities with their own, they could better make sense of the unfamiliar through a familiar framework. And as we'll see, often the practice of equating gods went beyond erudition, planting the seeds for modified religious cults that would grow around these syncretically fused entities. 
When it comes to understanding why Zeus and Amun were identified with each other, you don't have to think too hard about it. Zeus was the king of the gods, and in certain traditions, Amun, who had combined with the sun god to become Amun Ra, was the supreme god of the Egyptian pantheon. Another similarity is that they were each imbued with qualities approaching omniscience and omnipresence. Zeus, as the god of the sky, looked down at the world, the earth sheltering beneath his ever watchful eye, watched over by the dome of the heavens. Moreover, Helios, the personification of the sun, was also thought of in the same way. From up high, arcing across the world in his fiery chariot, it was he who often saw what others didn't, such as Hades' abduction of Persephone, an event virtually unnoticed by everyone except for him. Likewise, a moon was associated with the wind, something related to the sky and the atmosphere, which could be felt at any place at any time. This association, a moon and the wind, came about because of a moon embodying the quality of hidden power. He was invisible and his power was everywhere, ubiquitous like the wind. The oldest extant written work in which Greek gods are equated with Egyptian gods is attributed to Herodotus, a Greek historian often referred to as the father of history. His seminal work, Histories, written sometime in the back half of the 5th century BC, documents the practice of equating Greek gods with those of other cultures, including the Egyptians. In Histories, Herodotus frequently describes Egyptian gods and religious practices using Greek equivalents and comparisons. For instance, he equates the Egyptian gods Amun with Zeus, Osiris with Dionysus, and Horus with Apollo. This practice, now known as Interpretatio Greca, was common among the Greeks and reflected their tendency to interpret foreign deities and myths through the lens of their own religion, their gods, myths, and rituals. Similar to the Greeks, the Romans also had a practice of equating the deities of other cultures with their own. When the Romans expanded into new territories and encountered different religions, they often sought similarities between those foreign gods and their Roman equivalents. For example, the Germanic god Woden, essentially another name for Odin, was equated with Mercury, the Roman equivalent for Hermes. And the Celtic goddess Sulis was identified with Minerva, the Roman equivalent of Athena. This practice was part of the Roman approach to religion, which was inclusive and syncretic, allowing them to incorporate and assimilate the gods and religious practices of conquered peoples. More than any artifact from the past, though, the most interesting aspect of Zeus Amon's history is interwoven with the life of Alexander the Great, a man whose very name is synonymous with conquest and military genius. In the process of destroying the Persian Empire, winning decisive battle after decisive battle, Alexander liberated Egypt from Persian rule. Egypt had long been an unhappy Persian province, defeated and then subsumed by Persian hegemony some 200 years earlier. Despite losing their sovereignty and existing without it for generations, the master's leash ever chafed Egypt's neck. Discontent bubbled incessantly, and rebel activity was common. After suffering crushing defeats in successive battles to the Greeks, the Persian Empire, though had yet to collapse, lacked the strength to keep Egypt in the fold. It soon to be ripped from their grasp. Because the Egyptians so detested the yoke of their imperial overlords, they welcomed Alexander with open arms, willingly backing him with their support. Alexander was crowned pharaoh, and the pharaohs, in Egyptian culture, were divine, descended from gods. They were the living nexus through which the gods and humanity were connected. Thus it was that Alexander became imbued by the same divinity, taking the epithet, son of Zeus Amon, which resonated with Greeks and Egyptians alike. It was a name that invoked the divine, inspiring awe and a sense of mystique in friend and foe. From here, we are going to go over Alexander's annexation of Egypt, his coronation, and his death. 
This will take us to the dissolution of his empire, which quickly broke apart without a veritable god king to keep it all together. Such a vast empire with so many disparate cultures demanded no less. Many smaller empires emerged in the wake, many of them ruled over by Alexander's most prominent generals. One of these was the Ptolemaic Kingdom in Egypt. Under the Ptolemaic dynasty, Greek rule lasted some 300 years, until it was seized by the Romans in 30 BC. During these centuries, Greek culture and Egyptian culture mingled like never before. Certainly, this was not a time of unbroken peace. There were many players vying for power, and there were times of hostility and conflict between Macedonia, the city-states of southern Greece, and Ptolemaic Egypt. But nonetheless, this period was marked by extraordinary cultural and intellectual achievements, especially in Alexandria, founded by Alexander, the city's namesake, which became a renowned center for learning and the arts. In Alexander's time, ties between Egypt and Greece were significantly strengthened, both of them willing parts of his empire. Afterwards, though no longer provinces of the same power, the ties between them, strengthened earlier and years of alliance, remain stronger, if weakened some, than when Persia controlled the eastern Mediterranean. Exchange of every kind became more frequent. Osmosis accelerated, each permeating the other. Driving all of this, in large part, was that the Egyptian royalty was now Greek, hailing from Macedonia. Ptolemy was the dynasty's first pharaoh, and he played the part of the pharaoh well, ingratiating himself instead of forcing the issue as a Greek king. Alternatively, in counterproductive fashion, he could have been unwilling to embrace local ways, viewing himself as one come to enlighten a barbarous land. He and his successors made a deliberate effort to honor and endorse Egyptian religion, making sure not to alienate themselves and their ilk from the people they ruled, choosing assimilation over domination. However, before we get to all of this, Alexander had to commence his campaign and much more, which is where we'll pick the story up. In the year 334 BC, Alexander the Great, the young and audacious king of Macedonia, embarked on a campaign that would indelibly ink his name into the annals of history. With the might of the Macedonian phalanx and the fiery zeal of a vision bursting with grand designs, far more ambitious than a paltry victory or two and a conservative incursion into Asia Minor, he crossed the Hellespont, the narrow strait located in modern-day Turkey that served as a natural boundary between Europe and Asia. The air was charged with anticipation as thousands of soldiers, a formidable blend of Greek hoplites and Macedonian cavalry, traversed this pinched passage. Through the threshold, what lay before them was a tapestry of hostile territory and ancient civilizations, woven with exotic tales of opulence and peril, patterned with extraordinary exploits to come, Alexander's sight was fixed on the Persian Empire, the sprawling dominion of King Darius III, which lay spread out like a lavish feast waiting to have decadent dishes plucked from the table. As Alexander's campaign surged through Asia Minor, his reputation as both a military strategist and a leader of men burgeoned. The Battle of Issus in 333 BC marked a turning point. The Macedonian forces, vastly outnumbered, orchestrated a victory so crushing that it not only humbled the mighty Persian army, but also shook the foundation of Darius III's reign. The victory was a masterstroke of tactical brilliance, showcasing Alexander's understanding of terrain, troop deployment, martial tactics, and the psychology of warfare. The path now lay open to the ancient and mystical land of Egypt a realm steeped in timeless wonders, guarded by the enigmatic Sphinx. In 332 BC, Alexander entered Egypt, not as a conqueror, but as a liberator from Persian dominion. The Egyptians, weary of Persian rule, welcomed him with open arms, bestowing upon him the title of Pharaoh. It was at the Oracle of Siwa where Alexander was proclaimed the son of a moon linking him forever to the divine and the land of the Nile. The coronation was more than a political maneuver, 
it was a moment of transcendent significance. Intertwining Alexander's destiny through the commonality of divinity with the ancient and exalted lineage of Egyptian kings and gods. Centuries earlier, the Greeks had already equated a moon, whom they called Amon, with Zeus. The groundwork was already laid, the path clear. Alexander assumed the epithet son of Zeus Amon, harnessing the power of such a majestic title, mythologizing himself as a son of the divine. And just as he was masterful at war, so too is he a master at effective self-aggrandizement, making use of propaganda, such as it existed in his day. The image he cultivated, that of a divine king and unstoppable conqueror, was integral to keeping his empire together until the time of his death. By adopting this divine status, he wasn't just elevating his personal image, he was legitimizing his rule across different cultures. This portrayal resonated with both his Greek and Macedonian soldiers, who saw him as a semi-divine figure, and with the Egyptians, who accepted him as their pharaoh, divinity made flesh, he who bridged the gods and humanity. Alexander's coinage was an effective tool in spreading his image across the empire. Many of the coins he minted featured his likeness, often depicted with the ram horns of a moon, promulgating his divine persona. These coins were widely circulated, ensuring that his image as both a military conqueror and a godlike ruler was recognized throughout the empire. After Alexander the Great's death in 323 BC, Egypt entered a new era under the rule of one of Alexander's generals, Ptolemy I Soter. He established the Ptolemaic dynasty, which marked the beginning of the Hellenistic period in Egypt. The dynasty, of Macedonian origin, ruled Egypt from Alexander's death until the Roman conquest in 30 BC. The Ptolemaic rulers, while of Greek descent, embraced and incorporated many aspects of ancient Egyptian culture, religion, and administration. They portrayed themselves in the traditional style of Egyptian pharaohs and endorsed Egyptian religious institutions, which helped legitimize their rule in the eyes of the native population. The syncretism between Greek and Egyptian mythology during the Hellenistic period was a hallmark of the era, blending elements of these rich traditions into new forms of religious and cultural expression. A prime example of this, of course, the worship of Zeus Amon. He was revered in both cultures, symbolizing the fusion of Greek and Egyptian religious thought. The Oracle of Siwa, where Alexander the Great was famously confirmed as a son of a god, became a significant site of worship for Zeus Amon pilgrimages made to the sacred oasis where it took place. Another significant figure in the fusion of Greek and Egyptian religious culture was Serapis. This deity was deliberately created to unify Greek and Egyptian worshippers under Ptolemaic rule. Serapis combined aspects of Osiris and Apis from Egyptian mythology with Greek gods like Hades and Dionysus. The creation of Serapis represented a strategic approach to governance and religion, fostering unity among Greek and Egyptian populations. The Serapium in Alexandria, a temple dedicated to Serapis, became a prominent religious and cultural center, symbolizing the coexistence of Greek and Egyptian traditions. This blending of religious traditions extended beyond gods to include rituals, religious festivals, and temple architecture, further demonstrating the depth of cultural intermingling during the Ptolemaic era. Moreover, figures like Isis, an Egyptian goddess, saw her worship extend significantly into the Greek world. Greek adaptations of Isis absorbed and reshaped her attributes, often emphasizing her aspects as a universal mother and protector. Temples dedicated to Isis were established in various parts of the Greek world, and her cult became one of the most widespread across the Hellenistic kingdoms, and later across the Roman Empire, evidence of her cult found as far as Britain. And that's it for this video. If you enjoy the content, please like and subscribe. Thanks for watching.